Good morning and welcome to the Leadership Institute's January Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. It's the first of the year. My name is Patricia Rausch and it's great to see all of you. We do wish that we were in person, but you know how these things go. Uh, once in a lifetime storm that came out of nowhere in Virginia has us uh, being virtual this morning, but we're hoping to get back in person next month. Um, you were probably hoping to see Morton here, but Morton is nursing his healing arm and taking it easy after the new year. So I will be your host this morning. I encourage you all to live tweet today's event with hashtag WWCB. That stands for Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. In 2021, the Leadership Institute trained 12,216 students in 650 trainings. And then since 1979, your Leadership Institute has trained 243,004 students. When I started at the Leadership Institute, we had not even cracked 100,000. This is truly an incredible number. At the end of this event, you will be redirected to the training schedule on the LI website. There you will find all of the upcoming trainings. Please take a moment to review these schools and consider attending one or sending a friend to a training. There will be a chance to ask questions at the end of the talk. Please use the Zoom Q&A function to submit a question should you have one. I'm going to kick it over to Matt Hurt for a moment to talk, who is one of my esteemed colleagues, and he's gonna to talk to you about an exciting opportunity we have coming up at the Leadership Institute, a first of its kind training. So Matt, if you'd like to talk about that for just a moment, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much, Patricia. On Saturday, January 22nd, here uh, at our headquarters at the Stephen P.J. Wood Building at the Leadership Institute in Clarendon, uh, we're having a five hour training experience called Organizing Behind the Lines. This is a unique training. Uh, tailor-made for conservative activists who are organizing in liberal communities across Northern Virginia, the District of Columbia, and Maryland. We, we've had a tremendous outpouring of interest across this region. Uh, nearly 100 people have registered. There are still spaces available. Uh, this is going to be highly interactive, three hours of panel discussions to answer your questions from people who have done it on the ground in these communities a catered lunch, and then an opportunity to break out and, and share ideas for 2022 and beyond with people in your community. Uh, so I hope that you check us out. Leadershipinstitute.org slash training is where you can find that. And the early bird registration is just $10 today. Thank you. Over to you, Patty. Thank you so much. $10, that is a, a deal that should not be passed up. Um, and that will that be online as well or just in person? We're working through some of the some of the kinks to to make sure that it's online. I do hope to to offer it online. However, there are now 98 people registered for in person, and so it will be a great opportunity to fellowship with fellow conservatives across uh, across the Mid Atlantic here, Northern Virginia to to Baltimore and, and Annapolis. Yeah, that's great. It's uh, uh, LA trainings are always wonderful to network and meet new people and. Um, just for the end of the program's report, today is actually my last day at the Leadership Institute after nearly 14 years. Um, Deirdre thought it would be great for me to end with a wonderful hosting of the, of the Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. And I always like, I wish that Morton was online so I could thank him in person, but the people I can thank right now um, who have made it all possible are the, the donors. Um, the Leadership Institute continues to provide these valuable political and fundraising trainings online. They've been all the more crucial these last few months to support principled candidates in the election. And I personally thank the generous and loyal donors whose support has made all these possible, even through these uncertain times and for the last 14 years. Um, and I'm going to give it back to Matt so he can introduce our guest speaker this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. And for those of you who don't know Patty well or, or have never had the pleasure of uh, engaging with her at a training or leadership institute event, she's been a fantastic friend and mentor to many people who have worked here uh, before and many of our guest faculty. So thank you very much, Patty. Uh, good morning. I'm coming to you from the podcast studio of the Sacker Multimedia Center in the Stephen P.J. Wood Building here at the Leadership Institute. And I'm proud to introduce Karen Greenhall, the majority maker and delegate elect 
for Virginia's 85th district. Karen founded and developed Heritage Woodworks Incorporated, a highly successful custom cabinet manufacturing facility, which has spawned several growing Virginia Beach businesses. After selling Heritage Woodworks, Karen devoted herself to community service. She chose to volunteer as a counselor for local crisis pregnancy centers, where her mother had been a volunteer. When Karen's business acumen was discovered, she was asked to join the staff as manager. While she streamlined the business operations and improved patient care, Karen continued to serve as a counselor. The most rewarding aspect of her service was found in helping women who faced an unplanned pregnancy. For most women, a crisis situation by helping them make an informed decision and offering support no matter what. It was a difficult but rewarding responsibility which created a lifetime bonds with clients and shaped Karen's empathy for thousands of women in Virginia Beach. Managing the medical centers included meeting, <clears throat> meeting regulations like HIPAA that mandate the privacy and security of patient information. Karen recognized a growing need for addressing privacy, cybersecurity risks in healthcare and started Cyber Tiger. Karen's business quickly became a success and Cyber Tiger now supports leading edge organizations like the Mayo Clinic and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. She often travels to the United States sharing cybersecurity best practices at national and regional healthcare conventions on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services Cybersecurity Workgroup. As a parent, Karen has experience with public and private schools as well as homeschooling. Karen was one of the first homeschoolers in Virginia with Home Educators Association of Virginia. And Karen has two grown children. She lives in Virginia Beach and has taken more than 40 Leadership Institute trainings. I encourage you to ask questions using the Zoom Q&A function throughout Ms. Greenhall's talk. Uh, she will have time to answer some of those at the end. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Delegate-elect Karen Greenhall. Okay, well, good morning, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, you gave a lot of information. <laughs> I, um, I was um, born and raised right here in Virginia in Hampton Roads, born in Portsmouth. Um, I've worked in all five South Side cities. Um, my first business, um, I actually started in my garage. There was no money for me to go to college. I taught myself double entry um, accounting from library books and um, just decided uh, to do my best. I've always worked hard. I got that from my dad. My father was a Marine. Um, when he got out, um, he worked full time as a welder, weekends as a roofer, doing whatever he had to do to take care of his family. So I learned from my dad to work hard and not be afraid to take on a challenge. Um, and from my mom, I learned to um, just love being born in Virginia and proud of being an American. Um, my mom raised me to understand the, um, the value of our foundational principles and how important the Constitution is and how important it is that we hold on to those values. So that was my first business. And um, as Matt mentioned, I worked at the Crisis Pregnancy Centers here in Virginia Beach. Um, I actually started in Suffolk because my mom was a volunteer. My mom um, made a gift basket for every baby that was born um, in the clients of the Crisis Pregnancy Center. And my mom was a quilter. She made a quilt for every child that was born and prayed over the baskets. So when I had the, the time to be able to go volunteer, there was no question where I was gonna go. And when they brought me on staff, um, I explained to them, I'd be glad to um, be manager as long as they didn't take me away from counseling the girls. And it's one of the, um, one of the triggers for me deciding to get so involved in politics was when they, took away informed consent from women um, who are facing an elective abortion. And it's actually legislation that I'm working on entering to, to um, give back the right to informed consent to women who are considering abortion. And that's, um, I won't go too deep into that right now, um, but it was a very influential job for me. 
And with Cyber Tiger, yes, I was before COVID, I was traveling all over the country um, doing presentations. It was really exciting. We were making a difference. And I've stepped back from that because I really can't travel and be a good delegate. Uh, so I'm, I'm not traveling anymore. Um, I, my focus is on doing what's best for Virginia. Um, and my family is 100% supportive of my run for office. They're really excited for me. Um, but how I got into politics was simply because I always voted. Um, I always paid attention. And I saw America going off track. And then when um, I realized I was getting people to vote for, I had always voted Republican. It, it suited my conservative values. But it seemed as though too often I had to vote for people who had been in office for so long they didn't know what my life was like. Or it seemed as though they were saying what needed to be said to get reelected because they'd been in office for so long. And I got, I wanted to vote for someone who was willing to look at what the issues were and figure out solutions. So I had the bright idea of getting involved in the primary process. So I started going to Republicans who were running in a primary and talking to them, figuring out which one best suited my values, which one would support our constitutional values. And then I would help them win their primary and their general. So I got involved. I was walking doors, making phone calls. Um, I was a, just a volunteer helping to get people in office that I felt like would stand up for the principles that were so important. And I'm, I tend to um, I tend to go um, full tilt when I get into something. I joined the Republican Party of Virginia Beach. I joined all four Republican women's clubs. <laughs> I volunteered to be district chairman of my 85th district, which means I was responsible for recruiting and making sure that we had volunteers manning every poll while it was open on election day. And so um, that was a real challenge for me. Um, but I took that one on. And then when I saw the election laws being changed, I researched the election laws and found out about election observers and that we're supposed to have people representing the Republican Party as election officials and that we can have Republican observers in. And with the new laws, I just saw the potential for um, inaccuracies and mistakes. And the training for election officials wasn't even completed until two weeks before the first election. So I started recruiting and training volunteers to be election observers. And uh, that actually took off really well. Um, when, it, when I decided to run for office, one of the men that I trained took that over for me. And he is actually now um, leading the election integrity efforts for the whole city of Virginia Beach. Um, so in my 85th district, Republicans lost the seat in 2017. And so I was very closely watching the election in 2019 because I knew if we lost it again in 2019, it was gonna be a real challenge to ever win the seat again. So I decided it wasn't enough anymore for me to just walk doors and make phone calls. I wanted to be the best help for whoever was gonna run for that seat. So I started doing research and reading about how to manage campaigns and I found Leadership Institute. And they had scheduled a campaign management school for the week after the election. So I talked to my husband who was just as involved in all this volunteering as I was. We were walking doors together. So my husband and I agreed that if the Republicans lost the 85th House seat in 2019, that we would go to campaign management school and we would be the very best volunteers anybody could ever have and help make sure that the seat was won in 2021. So we went to campaign management school and I have to say, I loved it. Um, the values that were represented, the, um, the way the material was presented, um, I just, I was so excited, thoroughly enjoyed campaign management school, learned so much. 
Um, and then as the time went on, it turned out no one was stepping up to be the candidate. And I talked to my family and said, you know, if nobody steps up to run for this seat, uh, we can't just give it up. I may end up having to be the candidate. So I talked to my grown children, of course, my husband, and they were all supportive of me running. Um, so then I went to future candidate school. So my husband and I attended future candidate school, which was, again, just more wonderful information. And I'm going to get into the information a little bit more um, as I explain how I use that information to actually win my campaign. Uh, so when it became very clear that I was going to be the candidate, I went back to campaign management school for the second time and took my, my son, uh, my son, Zach, who had agreed to help me run my campaign until I could figure out how to, how to start raising money and hire people. So um, campaign management school, again, was the foundation for my campaign. And I did end up being the candidate. And because I'd been a strong volunteer for the local electeds. I had their support. They were giving me advice. And, um, and I ended up running for the 85th. I'd actually been told that no one thought we could win it. They said, especially, it couldn't be won by a first time candidate. Um, the seat hadn't been won by a Republican since the last redistricting maps had gone into place, which turned it from a purple district to a blue district. And um, I, I was told it was pretty much hopeless, um, but I decided we had to try. We couldn't just give it up. So I used everything that I learned at Leadership Institute to win my race. Um, Steve Sutton had taught us how to use um, something called the Leesburg Square. And the Leesburg Square teaches you how to compare your strengths and weaknesses with your opponent's strengths and weaknesses so that you can define your campaign. So instead of going negative, you're comparing yourself. It's to compare and contrast rather than having to go negative, which is something we see too often. So the Leesburg Square, um, we worked through it. And I actually used that information to write my first campaign plan, which um, I got instructions on writing my campaign plan at Leadership Institute. And they even gave us templates to follow. So by the time I was hiring staff, I'd done the Leesburg Square, had my campaign plan written um, and was off to a good start. Um, at Leadership Institute, I learned who I had to have on staff, which positions were the most important, and I learned what their responsibilities should be. So when I went to hire staff, I found people who agreed with my basic plan and would work with me to run my campaign the way I wanted it run. Because one of the things I learned at the Leadership Institute was that it was important that I take responsibility. It was my campaign my name was on the line. So I, I took that to heart. And with my staff, nothing was written, um, nothing, no Facebook post, no tweet, no email, nothing went out, no mailers without me seeing it and approving it first. Um, I did take full responsibility, but because of what I learned at the Leadership Institute, I had excellent staff to work with me and they were people I could trust. And because I understood from my training, the use of um, purchasing media and how it all worked with targeting voters, I had such a good understanding of that. It helped me make good decisions with my staff. I knew how to recruit and manage volunteers. I'd been a volunteer, but I had never recruited and managed and organized. And those are things that I learned in all of my trainings at Leadership Institute. So um, I had been knocking doors and Leadership Institute had reinforced for me how important it was to knock doors. And that actually became the focal point of my campaign. The whole campaign was arranged around getting my story and me in front of as many people as possible. And having such a great team of volunteers, they took care of so many things for me that it freed me up to spend my day, daytime was walking doors and after dark was making phone calls. 
And uh, so I actually, um, when we did the first polling, the first polling, I had better name recognition than the incumbent simply because of all that voter contact. And so with knocking doors, um, I really uh, enjoyed getting to meet people. I didn't just go to Republican doors. I went to swing voters. I went to independents. And I even started going to people who lean Democrat and just having a conversation, just like I did when I was a counselor at the Crisis Pregnancy Center. It's just having a conversation. I learned to um, just be myself, listen to people before I talk. I'm um, always ask questions. Um, why should anyone listen to me if I don't listen to them first? Uh, for, for example, one man, one of the most dramatic stories that I have about walking doors was um, I met a man in his driveway. And so we were, we were just talking. He said he'd never voted for a Republican. But I just said, well, you know, how do you feel? How do you feel about how things are in Virginia? How do you feel about the future for your family? You know, what concerns you? And this was an older African-American gentleman. And he said what concerned him the most was that he grew up in segregation. He remembered well not being able to go into the same room or use the same water fountain as other people. And he was so proud of Virginia because his children did not grow up in segregation. His children could get along with anyone, could go anywhere, could do whatever they wanted to do. His fears were his grandchildren. He said his grandchildren were being taught the same principles that caused him to have to live in segregation. So that became a very intense conversation when we talked about what's happening in the school systems and the dangers of striving for equal outcomes instead of helping each child on an individual basis. And his wife saw us talking and she came out of her, her house and she was coming closer and closer down the driveway. And, um, and you know, I just waved at her and she never spoke. But by the end, she was right there and the three of us were talking. She was nodding her head, even though she never spoke. And it was summertime, it was so hot and we were sweating. I said, I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm just keeping you out here in the sun. And he said, no, let's not stop. I've never talked to a Republican before. And so um, it's anyone can have a conversation as long as we stay calm and speak civilly to one another. That's what I learned. There was another young lady I met on her front porch. And um, by then I had learned, I didn't say I was a Republican candidate. I just said I was running for office and started a conversation. And um, so I was talking to this young lady. Again, we ended up talking about equity and education. And she was a firm believer in equal outcomes. And so, but as we talked, and we talked about what that meant, how we would get equal outcomes in the schools. And, and I told her right now in Virginia, the average high school student graduates with a seventh grade reading level. And it, the most recent study of the standards, the passing standards for fourth and eighth grade in all 50 states, we were the lowest. We were the lowest expectation for fourth graders and eighth graders. To pass, to, um, to pass on to the next grade. And that's not good. And so we were talking about those things and she wasn't aware of those facts. And I told her where she could go look them up. And by the time we finished, um, we were talking about abortion. And she was 100% pro-choice. And I said, um, well, you know, what about the informed consent issue. I said, you know, the, the argument we have right now is protecting women who are considering an abortion and giving them the same right to information that every other person has when they go for any other elective abortion. And so, and I explained to her what the law was and she said, that can't be right. And so I promised to email it to her, which I did. I emailed that law to her so that she could see that the right 
to inform consent had been stricken from the law and it pertained only to women um, seeking an abortion. So then it dawned on her that um, I might not be a Democrat. So she asked us, no, actually I'm the Republican candidate. And we were laughing. She said, I can't believe that we just had a conversation and found where we were in agreement instead of just focusing on where we disagreed. And we ended the conversation with um, joking that she should run for office. And she and I would go up there and show them how it needs to be done. <laughs> um, and then, but not everyone I talked to was in disagreement with me. Uh, there was one man, I had left a flyer on his door. He didn't answer the door. And so I was walking down the street and then I heard him calling my name. And uh, he had opened the door and gotten my flyer. And so I ran back up to his door and he said he'd seen me on TV, seen my mailers, couldn't believe I was at his front door, but he was scared. He said, the country's too far gone. He said, you know, it, it, it's as though everything's upside down. People don't know what's right and wrong anymore. We've lost our moral standard. And so we, we talked about that. And I said, you know, if we lose our moral standard, then we are at the mercy of whatever the person in power thinks is right and wrong. And we can't let that happen. And so he said he felt like there was no use in voting. He was afraid. And I explained to him, if we can do this in Virginia, if we can turn, for, turn Virginia back to conservative principles, we'd be giving hope to people just like him all over the country. And if they could look at Virginia and say, if they can do it in Virginia, we can do it in our state. I said, we can turn this whole country around if we can take back Virginia this fall. And so this man, um, he talked afterwards, I found out because he emailed me, talked to his adult son. They both went to vote for me. And while they were standing in line at early voting, they saw a volunteer wearing my hat. And he called the volunteer over and said, I know her, I'm here to vote for her. And so it was just really touching. So this man emailed me later and said that he had hope for Virginia and told me about meeting my volunteer. And, um, and in fact, after I was elected, he's, we've already been in touch. And uh, he's just really encouraged. So I had voters tell me they'd never voted for a Republican, but they would vote for me just because I went to their door. When I was um, walking doors, I only met four people who had met the incumbent. His name recognition was so low. And, uh, but I met people who said they would vote for me simply because I took time to listen and took time to hear their side instead of just telling them mine. And some people said they would vote for me because I'm a mother and a grandmother. And I was obviously not looking for a career. I just wanted to help. So um, election day, election day for me was really exciting. They put me, we decided I would work at a poll um, that was gonna have the highest activity. And I was there all day and it was so exciting to have people come in and talk to me like they knew me. And that voter contact, that was drilled into me at Leadership Institute that I focused my campaign on paid off. I had people coming up saying, I know you, your dad was a Marine. I know you, you talked to me on my front door. And, and um, I had people coming up, taking the blue Democrat ballot, going in to vote and coming out and giving me a thumbs up. And it, it was just such a wonderful day. My son worked my poll with me and I had uh, the Virginia Beach Sheriff was with me. And so we were all really excited. So, but that evening at the victory party, my race was too close to call. And it was um, really challenging because the, the party was excited. They wanted me to go out and declare victory, but I, re I said I didn't wanna declare victory until I was sure. And the vote went back and forth. First I was winning, then I wasn't, then I was winning. And my consultant who I trusted, I actually hired one of the best consultants in the country. And he said, he felt like the numbers were wrong. There was an error. He believed I won, but he wasn't, he wasn't sure the numbers were good. And I decided I would not declare victory until my consultant 
said the numbers were true. So I didn't get to go and give a victory speech, but I had a little bit of a problem because I had people there that were going to go on stage with me, whether I won or lost. I don't, um, you've probably heard of a group called Generation Joshua. Those are young people who are high school and college students from all over the country. And they go and volunteer to walk doors for candidates who share their conservative values. They're actually mostly homeschoolers and I homeschooled both of my children. I was endorsed by the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which just thrilled me. And so I had 45 young people come in the last few days of the campaign and walk doors for me. And I went and met them, had dinner with them. And um, I was just so impressed with these young people. I wanted them to get credit whether I won or lost. So I told the, um, the manager, uh, the, the, um, <laughs> the chairman of the Republican Party in Virginia Beach, I said, please, I, don't, I, I, I can't make a speech for win or lose, but I have something I have to say. And he let me go up. And so I explained Generation Joshua and had all 45 of those kids come up and get on stage with me. And I said, my race is too close to call, but I believe one reason it's too close to call is because these kids did 20,000 voter contacts in four days for me and for Glenn Youngkin. And I wanted them to get credit for everything that they did because I believed that's why my race was too close to call instead of making a, um, a concession speech. So the next day I had won by 202 votes. By the time the vote was verified by the city, I was down to 157, which gave my opponent the right to request a recount. So while, while my recount took place, I was at orientation in Richmond, training on how to be a delegate. And the recount, I didn't realize what a big deal a recount would be. It was a legal process. There were judges involved who set the rules. Um, there was a very narrow criteria for people who could come and work in the recount. And, um, but I was, I was honored to have um, some very, um, very experienced people volunteer to step up and come and work the recount on my behalf. And I had an excellent attorney. My consultant was there. My new legislative aide was there. So I could just, it was just like my campaign. I had good people taking care of everything else so I could walk doors. I had good people taking care of the recount so I could learn to be a good delegate. So, and afterwards I had won by only 115 votes. So my race was so important because at the time Republicans had only won 50 seats in the house. We hadn't won the majority. And when my race was declared that I was the winner, we were the majority in the House of Delegates for the first time. And it was really exciting. So, so, so far, uh, as I said, I've done orientation. Um, I'm working on introducing legislation to protect women. Um, another thing I got to do, one thing that was so exciting, um, I met a man walking doors. And he had an autistic child. And we talked about the um, arrest in Virginia Beach of a young man who was autistic and the difficulties because someone with autism, when they're in a crisis situation, they typically cannot communicate. And the police don't realize why they can't communicate. So this man and I stood on his front porch and talked about well, what, what could be done how could we solve that problem? How can we let the police know they're dealing with an autistic young adult who can't communicate? Um, it's not that they don't want to, they simply can't. They're not being belligerent. And we came up with this broad idea that I said, well, you know what? If I ever get to meet the police chief, I'm gonna tell him our idea and get his opinion. So after I was elected, I got to meet the chief police, uh, Chief Newtigate. We had that discussion. He thought it was a good idea and we came up with a plan 
on how to possibly move forward and see if we can make that plan work. And I got to go back to my voter's house and tell him that I actually remembered our discussion, had that discussion with the chief of police and, uh, and went back and found him to tell him about it. Um, the, the incumbent that I replaced was one of the most partisan delegates that we had in the house. So another, another exciting piece of legislation for me um, deals with my friend, Jen Kiggins, um, who's actually um, one, of, one, of the, one of my best friends in, um, in Virginia Beach. So she had introduced a piece of legislation that made perfect sense. It simply said, now that we have an election season, we need to update the roles more frequently, the voter roles. We need to remove people who died and moved away more frequently because it was being done once a month, maybe every two months. There was no fixed time for having that done. So she wanted to have it done every week so that when we go to vote, we're voting um, on accurate roles. It makes perfect sense. It went through the Senate with bipartisan support and it landed in the House in the committee that my opponent was on. So um, Senator Kiggins called him and said, hey, you know, I represent everyone in your district, got this really good bill. It's not changing anyone being able to vote. It's just an accuracy bill. Will you help my bill get out of committee? And he actually told her that he'd gotten a call from his caucus and was told to make sure that that bill did not get out of committee. And it did it. So um, I get to introduce the bill into the house that Jen Kiggins had tried to introduce and the incumbent I defeated um, for partisan reasons had stopped. <clears throat> so the, um, there was one other lesson that I learned at the Leadership Institute and it came from, um, from Morton. I got to hear him speak several times in my trainings. And one of the things he said was that I always had to stay true to myself, that I, whether I won or lost, no matter what happened with the campaign, no matter how I was attacked, I had to stay true to myself. And because no matter what, I, was, I had to live my life on the other side of this. And so I, he encouraged us to hold on to our values. And one really important and valued that I've always lived by is to treat people the way I want to be treated. Back when I first took on being district chairman, uh, that very first election, I, um, I spent my day running around to all the election polls more than once because I wanted to meet every volunteer who worked every shift and give them a gift bag with bottles of water and I had Oreos and nabs and a thank you card from me. And one lady, when I gave her the bag, um, she started to cry. She said she'd been manning her pole for eight years and no one had ever told her thank you. And so I made up my mind in my campaign saying thank you was going to be a priority, um, which is why tomorrow I'm actually hosting a thank you luncheon for everyone who volunteered on my campaign from walking doors to working on that recount. And so I'd like to end what I have to say here today by thanking the Leadership Institute. Um, I thank you just so much for the work you're doing, preparing people like me who want to help and don't know what to do first, you're giving us the tools and the encouragement that we need to step up and speak out. And so often I have young women, especially coming up to me and saying, you know, I think I could do this. I think I could run for office. What should I do first? And I tell them, go find Leadership Institute. And um, I would just like to thank Morton Blackwell for his encouragement and Steve Sutton, um, with his, his unique presentations. And Ron Nayrig was also one of my favorite speakers, um, just raising the level for responsibility. So as a first time candidate, 
I ran a race that I was told couldn't be won. I defeated a well-funded incumbent Democrat on their own blue map. And I give a lot of credit for that to the Leadership Institute. So thank you so much. I don't think I could have won without you.